Okay, so very excited both to be in a brand new um, volume of the Norton Anthology, Volume E, which is chock full of good information, as were the two previous volumes, and we didn't get to look at even a tenth of them. So there's a lot of good information in there, but we've kind of made this careful, hopefully careful, selection of texts as we've gone through the class. And I want to start with Elizabeth Bishop. Um, I actually want to start with a poem that's going to be a pretty significant jump forward in time. Uh, we're going to start today with In the Waiting Room, because I think it's going to help give some context to the other things we'll see from Elizabeth Bishop in this discussion, starting on page 19, oh sorry, starting on page 66, uh, 66, we're looking at a poem in the waiting room from Elizabeth Bishop, and it, uh, uh, it's a poem I want to start with because it actually contains a reference to the beginning of, um, of World War I, uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. Um, but before we do that, let's take up In the Waiting Room, which is on page 66 of your Norton Anthology. In Worcester, Massachusetts, I went with Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist's appointment and sat and waited for her in the dentist's waiting room. I'm going to keep going in a moment. Notice how prosaic the poetry is, right? By which I mean this is written in with grammar, diction, phrasing that would not at all be out of place in prose. So paragraphs of narrative in a short story. In Worcester, Massachusetts, I went with Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist's appointment and sat and waited for her in the dentist's waiting room. It was winter. It got dark early. It's New England. We're living through it, or we're just coming out of it right now, right? The rating room was full of grown-up people, arctics and overcoats, lamps and magazines. My aunt was inside, what seemed like a long time. And while I waited, I read the National Geographic. I could read and carefully studied the photographs. The inside of a volcano, black and full of ashes. Then it was a spilling over in rivulets of fire. Osa and Martin Johnson, and if we follow our footnotes, we see that they are famous explorers represented in the National Geographic, dressed in riding breeches, laced boots, and pith helmets. A dead man slung, over, slung on a pole, long pig, right? Polynesian cannibals name for the human carcass, in case you're wondering. Uh, and National Geographic, if you've never looked at one, is once quite notorious for these kinds of... Um, representations of native people, uh, which were often quite exploitive, um, but more on that in a little bit. The, captain, the caption said, babies with pointed heads wound round and round with a string, black naked women with necks wound round and round with wire, like the necks of light bulbs. Their breasts were horrifying. I read it right straight through. I was too shy to stop. And then I looked at the cover, the yellow margins, the date. I think the date's important. We'll see why in a second. Suddenly, from inside, came an O oh of pain. Aunt Consuelo's voice. Not very loud or long. I wasn't at all surprised. Even then, I knew she was a foolish, timid woman. I might have been embarrassed, but wasn't. What took me completely by surprise was that it was me, my voice, in my mouth. So if we go back to the top of the stanza, suddenly from inside came, came an O oh of pain. Then we have it confused with Aunt Consuela's voice. Without thinking at all, I was my foolish aunt. I, we, were falling, falling, our eyes glued to the cover of the National Geographic, February 1918. Okay, <laughs> so what's, what's happening? Well, notice for how long the poem in the first long stanza and then about halfway down the second stanza, we have this very orderly series of events that are being described. 
around this individual who's regarding the National Geographic. We have the recognition of a date, February 1918, at a moment in the poem where suddenly we have this confusion about on Consuela's voice, the voice of the person reporting the poem, presumably a young woman, accompanying her to the office. We have this, we have this moment of, of identity confusion. And suddenly we're kind of tossed out of the perhaps quite easy to imagine and understand narrative that has been laid out so far. But that National Geographic with the date seems to be significant to the event, right? To the moment of confusion. I said to myself, three days and you'll be seven years old. I was saying it to stop the sensation of falling off the round, turning world and cold blue-black space. And then the question is, how does that emotion and experience relate to the larger story that's been described? Is this an emotional experience the young woman is having, ha having when she has this moment of identity confusion with her aunt while she's regarding the National Geographic? Is this some more significant, serious break where she's reflecting on this, instance, this instant later in time? Or does this moment come from some other point in time? It's not exactly clear at this moment. I said to myself, three days and you'll be seven years old. I was saying it to stop the sensation of falling off the round turning world into cold blue black space, but I felt you are an I. You are an Elizabeth. You are one of them. Why should you be one too? The questions, their answers, their source are not necessarily clear. However, notice they all relate to this issue of identity. I scarce, scarcely dared to look to see what it was I was. I gave a sidelong glance. I couldn't look any higher at shadowy gray knees, trousers, and skirts, and boots, and different pairs of hands lying under the lamps. I, are these the lamps in the dentist's office? I knew that nothing stranger had ever happened, that nothing stranger could ever happen. Why should I be my aunt? Or me? Or anyone? This moment of questioning identity. What similarities, boots, hands, the family voice I felt in my throat, or even the National Geographic and those awful hanging breasts held us all together or made us all just one? I, sir, how? I don't know any word for it. How unlikely. How had I come to be here, like them, and overhear a cry of pain that couldn't have got loud and worse, but hadn't. If we take those two stanzas aside, and as I've mentioned earlier, it's always a good idea to take poetry very slowly, carefully, cautiously, I would say let's just take a moment before we get to the end and let's think a little bit about Robert Frost, um, you know, uh, regarding two paths in the woods um, and internally coming to some kind of conclusion about the significance of the choices that he might make to his identity. Let's think about the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock and think about the significance of that individual's sense of a complete inability to assert himself in his environment. And now we have this poem from Elizabeth Bishop written many years later far into the nuclear age, well into the Cold War age, where we have this moment of intense identity confusion, contextual associations that lead the voice to essentially lose its immediate bearings in terms of some of the fundamental things that people take for granted. I am me, you are you, here are the things that distinguish us, here are the things that bind us, 
what are these things? It's delivered to us from the perspective of a child, perhaps coming to a moment where the child recognizes that she has an identity that is distinct from someone else's, but then also at that same moment, we get the questioning that might be involved in that, that moment of isolation, the feeling of being divorced from something certain. And that's one of the reasons why I want to talk about this poem, is because it's going to re remind us of World War I by the time we get to the end. So we have all of those really interesting questions that come up. And then we go back to, the waiting room was bright and too hot. It was sliding beneath a big black wave. Another. And another. And when we first encounter that, we don't know what it means. Then I was back in it. The war was on. Outside, in Worcester, Massachusetts, were night and slush and cold, and it was still the 5th of February, 1918. The date is helpful because the 5th of February, 1918, is the date of the sinking of the SS uh, Tuscana. I believe I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, it's not footnoted here, but it's essentially the first shipload of American soldiers to uh, be torpedoed uh, on their way to Europe uh, at the beginning of, for the Americans anyway, um, uh, World War I. Okay? And that event resulted in the death of several hundred soldiers uh, and is usually associated with the American involvement in the First World War and the beginning of that on a massive scale. Why is she thinking about that? Right? It's 1976. Is this a thought that has been brought to her from her experience with the National Geographic? The National Geographic, of course, being a text that notoriously for many decades would represent people, places, and things that were beyond the everyday experience of North Americans still exists, the National Geographic Station. They go to jungles and mountains and valleys, and they represent parts of the world most people don't ever go to. And historically, they have been a little questionable in terms of the representation of Native people, and a little questionable, I think, is probably giving them an awful lot of credit, exploiting black bodies, exploiting bodies that stand outside of kind of common everyday experience in North America, um, oftentimes under the pretense of a scientific enterprise. But we have a child in this poem engaging the National Geographic, which is representing people, places, and things, and finding in that moment an incredible sense of uncertainty about who she is, what defines her culture, what distinguishes her from her other family members, or what ties her to her other family members. And we also have at the end, and I bring up the sinking um, of the ship because we have this reference to the big black wave, and then another, then another. The, thing, the, 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 the sinking of that torpedoed vessel uh, was very significant to the beginning of the American, of American involvement in World War I. So she's, she's thinking about all these things, right? And it's impacting her as a child. And that, but that's just one way to read the poem. Um, are we trying to imagine that this dentist office visit is happening maybe in 1918 and that's, and that's the distinction to be made? Maybe the date has nothing to do with the National Geographic? Or maybe the date is just something that she comes up with on her own as a result of having all these questions about identity kind of thrown at her suddenly and she's relating it to this question of identity that begins with American involvement in World War I. There's multiple ways to go here and I'm not trying to chart only one. But I want you to notice a couple of things. I want you to notice the uh, the ama her amazing ability to speak to us in again the language of the common and the everyday and then to drive us with that same language into this incredibly um, uh, topsy turvy experience where we are no longer sure you know who is speaking why is speaking what is it they are saying and how it maybe relates to the earlier parts of the poem, but we understand that there must be some kind of relationship here between these more concrete, easier to understand aspects of the poem and then these far more abstract moments of intense questioning. We see something very much like that 
um, in the man moth on page 55 um, and it's a it's a as footnoted it's a uh, it's a little difficult because uh, the man moth we see here um, is supposedly the result of a typographical error where what she titled it originally was the mammoth What's not clear from the footnote in the Norton is if man moth is a typo everywhere it appears or if it's only a typo in that first line. And, and as you'll hear, the, dif the distinction is important because a lot of the imagery that gets associated with the man moth, as it's described in the poem, it indeed sounds like a moth or a man slash moth. But are we supposed to read this mammoth? That's a layer of confusion. I don't know if the artist intended, but... But anyway, we'll we'll think a little bit about that. So this is so this is a poem that sounds very different from uh, the waiting room poem. This is on page fifty-five. Here above, cracks in the building are filled with battered moonlight. The whole shadow of man is only as big as his hat. It lies at his feet like a circle for a doll to stand on. And he makes an inverted pin, the point magnetized to the moon. He does not see the moon. He observes only her vast properties, feeling the queer light on his hands neither warm nor cold, of a temperature impossible to record in thermometers. There are multiple ways to come at this. I think the most straightforward way in terms of the course and how we have developed the course, developed in the course so far, is to come to this uh, observation that when Bishop is writing to us, she's not trying to carefully describe a scene in which we understand how all the pieces relate to each other. She's presenting us with a series of related images and she's providing a tone for those images and their association or it's making, it, it, it's, it's the association of these images and their tone that we must kind of recognize if we're to come to some understanding of what's happening in this piece. So this is not at all like in the waiting room where we have a very straightforward scene description coming to us. Here above, cracks in the building are filled with battered moonlight. What is battered moonlight? I think that's a good place to start. The whole shadow of man is only as big as his hat. Well, he's, she's talking about the individual she's regarding as an abstraction, right? Man, capital M. It's not the whole shadow of Harry or Dave or George or Paul or some other specific individual. She's talking about the conception of a man. The whole shadow of man is only as big as his hat. It lies at his feet like a circle for a doll to stand on. And he makes an inverted pin, the point magnetized to the moon. He does not see the moon. He observes only her vast properties, feeling the queer light on his hands, neither warm nor cold, of a temperature impossible to record in thermometers. This is not um, the tulip fields that Edna St. Vincent Millay gives us. This is not the slum slash ghetto that T.S. Eliot gives us. This is language much more, I would argue, in keeping with something like the wasteland, but perhaps of a different order. Because at least in the wasteland, we have all of these really specific literary references and cultural references that bring added context to the narrative. In the man moth, we, we, have, we don't know what the context is. We don't have an organizing principle to understand the appearance 
of every subject or the relation between every subject. And this, I would argue, and I know there's an awful lot that's happened since the Freudian revolution and the Hubble revolution, but I think what you're seeing in the man moth is a very natural progression in the artistic community of, of what happens with some of those fundamental questions. When the individual becomes this infinitely complex, infinitely reducible subject of inquiry that can never be known with anything like precision, when the universe itself becomes so vast that the concept of context actually begins to lose all meaning, what happens to artistry when such notions persist? And other notions obviously have, have come up and been significant to the development of North America uh, in, um, in the years uh, preceding this poem, although it's 1935, it's not that far out from um, As I Lay Dying and the poetry that we've looked at already this semester. Um, it's, a, it's a distinct landscape, and I think at this point it's really Im important to recognize that a lot of the poetry you read a few weeks ago, a lot of it was published between, you know, early 19-teens and then some up into the 1940s, some all the way to 1960s, so like of modern poetry and stuff like that, um, it, it's talking about this world that's developing, right, these different points of view that are developing, and in the poetry of Elizabeth Bishop, one of the things that we see is this sense of, the sense of the definite the sense of the particular is, is, is draining away. And you get that, I think, in the very last sentence of this first stanza. Uh, the second to last sentence, neither warm nor cold, of a temperature impossible to record in thermometers. Representing that which has not been possible to represent before, precisely because we are attuned to things now that we were not attuned to prior. I hope that makes some sense. Um, it's a poetry to explore this, this new landscape that's opening up to people who are asking these questions about identity and the relationship of the self to the universe and the idea of certainty. But when the man moth pays his rare, although occasional, visits to the surface. The moon looks rather different to him. Which is a really odd thing to say because in the previous stanza we know that the man described is not looking at the moon. So the moon can't look different in relationship to the man moth because man isn't looking at the moon. So who is the person that the moon looks different? You know, Who's the individual that sees the moon in a way that's different than the man moth? Again, we don't know, and the poem is deliberately constructed in this way. He emerges from an opening under the edge of one of the sidewalks. And this is one of those moments when I think the difference between mammoth and man moth is really important uh, because you can't imagine a mammoth emerging under the opening um, from the edge of one of the sidewalks and nervously begins to scale the faces of buildings. He thinks the moon is a small hole at the top of the sky, proving the sky quite useless for protection. He trembles, but must investigate as high as he can climb. Notice that in this stanza, nothing is specific, besides the man moth, by, by which I mean you have faces of buildings, which buildings, up the facades, his shadow dragging like a photographer's cloth behind him. And again, if it's a mammoth, it's a very different image than if it's a man moth. He climbs fearfully, thinking that this time he will manage to push his small head, again, would suggest not a mammoth, through that round, clean opening and be forced through, as from a tube, in black scrolls on the light. Man standing below him has no such illusions. But what the man moth fears most he must do, although he fails of course and falls back, scared but quite unhurt. There's more to the poem and you'll read it on your own, but what I want you to really think about as you engage these poems is the experience of uncertainty as being a feature of the poem. So the words of the poem lead us, lead us not to know and lead us to questions. They lead us to uncertainty. They lead us to a position of not understanding 
rather than the opposite. When I read something like The Red Wheelbarrow, I have a very specific, intense image that comes to me. When I read In the Waiting Room, I'm driven to a moment where what I thought I had a very specific understanding of, I in fact realize I have, very, I have no understanding of what it was exactly that I just saw. Or it's very hard to be very concise about what it was I just experienced. In The Man Moth, um, I have these questions about context. I have these questions about purpose. I have these questions about identity. I have these questions about perspective. So I, I, I bring that up because when we read As I Lay Dying, for as revolutionary as that piece is, there is a very specific human being behind every perspective that you encounter in the text. And that's one of the reasons why the text is so wonderful is because you come to know all these characters so well and you come to understand the world as they understand the world. But, but when you do that, you know, what you're, what you're still asserting is that, well, there's this person who can be known and the author Faulkner has organized all these fascinating characters together and now I have this community view of events. When we read Elizabeth Bishop's poetry, one of the things I want you to pick up on is the possibility that the consideration of an individual in either in the waiting room or in the man moth or in some of the other poems you'll look at in this piece, when we think about the individual, it, it may be the case that we don't come to a position of understanding and awareness. It may be, in fact, that the individual is, is, is inscrutable. That is, the specificity of who they are escapes our understanding. That's a very unnerving possibility. And it's one that we don't think about very often, right? Um, what, is, what would it mean to simply be incapable of understanding the complexity of the people you're encountering? It, it puts the reader in a very vulnerable position. And some people are going to like that vulnerability. Some people aren't going to like that vulnerability. Um, but I kind of offer it, I offer it to you as a very specific voice in the pantheon of American authors that we're looking at in this course. The one poem that I didn't, I didn't uh, assign, that I kind of wish I had, uh, and I won't talk much longer because I'll, I'll try to keep this to 30 minutes, but um, I, I wish I had assigned uh, The Moose because it's, it's pretty famous. Um, so you might want to take a look at The Moose um, and, uh, and go with it. So, so I offer you Elizabeth Bishop as, as a radical new voice um, and I look forward to hearing how it is you contrast her to other poets that we've read so far this semester. She's quite challenging. Um, and I hope you enjoy the challenge. Okay, so have fun, and I look forward to seeing what you do.